Welcome everybody to this uh, Global Virus Network webinar uh, for Front of Virology. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to welcome uh, all of you. And uh, before starting, as usual, for those of you who, who maybe do not know very well what the GVN is about, the Global Virus Network has been created in 2011 by Bob Gallo and Billy Hall. And uh, this is really a network which is based on science, on independence, merging the best experts in virology worldwide. We have now uh, 70 centers all over the world and 11 affiliates. Uh, our activities are really based on research and in particular task force on the different topics, obviously COVID-19, but also monkeypox, dengue, public health, and uh, many other topics. We have a lot of education and training activities with the GVN Academy and also advocacy communication. And uh, in this context, it's really today a great, great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Diane Griffin. Diane Griffin has been Uh, from the very beginning, very much supporting the Global Virus Network. And uh, she is a professor in medicine and neurology at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Uh, she is a John Hopkins University Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology and in the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And very important, of course, also, she is vice president of the US National Academy of Science. Uh, Diane has been trained for her MD. She is an MD PhD. She has been trained for her MD and PhD at uh, Stanford University. And then uh, she moved to John Hopkins, uh, where she has been a faculty. Uh, for uh, a long time now. Uh, she's a very famous scientist, uh, very much focused on the persistence of viruses, RNA viruses, in particular measles, encephalitis, and now COVID-19. And she will give a, le a lecture, as you can see from the slides, on this very important topic of RNA persistence after acute RNA viral infections and lessons from uh, COVID. I forgot one thing, which is important. She has received the Bob Gallo GVN Award. And uh, again, is very much supporting the uh, Global Virus Network. So thank you very much, Diane, for this, uh, for this lecture. Okay, well, thank you, Christian, for the very nice uh, introduction. And it's a pleasure to participate in the uh, GVN's uh, webinar uh, series, which I think has been very important. So um, <clears throat> as has been mentioned, and as my title indicates, I'm going to talk about virus persistence, which is after our acute RNA virus infections, which has been an area of interest for us uh, for quite a while. In fact, I give you a little historical uh, perspective on how we came to our current understandings of this. Uh, but first of all, I would like to just have an overview of, of, of the virus infections in, or in general. And uh, one of the th tasks that viruses have is, <clears throat> for human viruses at least, is being maintained in the population. And most virus infections fall into this category that we think of as acute uh, virus infections, where uh, this line represents a amount of infectious virus. So you get infected, you get sick, you live or you die. And if you live, uh, you clear the virus infection and then you become immune to reinfection with that virus. And that's sort of the classic paradigm. Uh, that means that these viruses have to be very efficiently transmitted during this relatively short period of time when the individual is infectious uh, to be maintained in a population. And they also then become targets for eradication, which we really only accomplished with uh, smallpox um, and then rinderpest in cattle. So, um, but other virus infections have uh, 
strategies that are a little more assured of being able to be maintained. Uh, certainly the herpes viruses that uh, cause an acute infection then become latent and are really detectable only with molecular techniques for, uh, could be very long periods of time, but then can reactivate and produce infectious virus again is uh, an excellent way to be maintained. Uh, and then there are the persistent uh, infections and uh, uh, human immunodeficiency virus and, and hep hepatitis C virus are, are very good examples where uh, essentially uh, either all or most people who become infected uh, become uh, uh, shed uh, infectious virus, uh, this is in the absence of treatment, obviously, uh, infectious virus for uh, very long periods of time, uh, years. Uh, these viruses, for the most part, don't kill their hosts early, uh, and, because, and then they have a very long period of time uh, for transmission, and that doesn't need to be very uh, efficient because they have a long time. So back to the, uh, the RNA viruses, we're changing our thinking about that uh, to a certain degree by the fact that we now know that we can detect, and that will be the topic of uh, most of the rest of the talk, uh, uh, viral RNA for long periods of time after uh, we can no longer detect infectious virus. So we don't think that people are infectious during this period of time for the most part, but, but that RNA it does persist and has the opportunity uh, to, uh, to reactivate uh, in certain individuals. So an overview of what we're gonna talk about today is first of all, I'm gonna provide a historical background, which is mostly work from my lab uh, and how we came to our current uh, understanding. Then, um, uh, then it talks more uh, about basic principles of uh, just how is a virus infection cleared? What's the evidence that there's uh, RNA persistence uh, after these acute uh, virus infections? So we're going to be focused entirely on uh, acute RNA virus and non-retroviral RNA virus infections. Uh, where does it, uh, RNA persist? What form is the RNA in and why can't we and we can't recover infectious virus. Um, why doesn't the immune response eliminate these infected cells? And why doesn't the virus kill the cell? And what are the consequences of this persistence uh, RNA? So the two virus infections that we studied, which uh, Christian mentioned, uh, are first of all, alpha virus uh, encephalomyelitis, uh, which is a mouse model uh, for uh, infection. And the other is measles, which uh, actually doesn't have a good small animal model. So we study it both in people and in uh, uh, and rhesus macaques. So I'm going to start with alpha viruses because that's where our initial um, observations were and, and questioning about this clearance issue um, came. Uh, so the alpha virus that we studied is Cindus virus. And, and these are alpha viruses are plus strand RNA viruses that have relatively small genomes, 11 KB. They replicate entirely uh, in the uh, cytoplasm. And for the encephalitic alpha viruses, which was what we've been interested in, uh, the target cells are neurons. And so here are a picture of in situ hybridization of anterior horn cells of a mouse infected with Synbus virus. And you can observe a couple of things. First of all, only neurons are infected. So other cells uh, in the vicinity uh, are not infected. So it's a very neuronotropic virus. And uh, secondly, the, all the replications in the cytoplasm, the nucleus is not involved. Uh, so it doesn't have, uh, uh, there's no obvious mechanism. So any persistence is going to have to be in the cytoplasm, uh, not through a nuclear uh, mechanism. So when you infect mice with the strain of virus that we use for these types of studies, um, they actually get sick. So this is the, uh, and you can, uh, if you do clinical scoring of the mice over a period of time, uh, they, they get sick, but then they get better and then recover uh, completely uh, from uh, infection. If you look at 
virus clearance from the brain, since so these mice are infected in the central nervous system. Uh, and uh, if you look at the amount of infectious virus in the brain, what you find is that it peaks around day three to five, and then is cleared. And, and by day 10 to 12 after infection, you can no longer recover uh, infectious virus. So infectious virus is cleared really quite promptly after um, and really uh, uh, correlates with the, um, uh, with the uh, clinical signs that you see in the uh, mice as well. And if you look at mortality, then none of them die. They all, uh, they all recover. So, um, so the mice become sick. They clear the virus and they recover, but what's the mechanism? Because now we're talking about a cell that is not replaceable uh, for the most part. Uh, it's a long-lived uh, cell and that the only cells that are infected are neurons. So how can the immune response clear the virus and allow the mice to recover completely without harming the, uh, the neurons? And that was the early question that, uh, that we answered, and that we asked. I'm not sure we've completely answered it yet. Uh, uh, but the approach that we used was first to find out what component of the immune response was actually responsible for this clearance process. Uh, and so um, th these were skin mice. So they're, they're mice that mount no adaptive immune response to the, uh, to the virus. Uh, and if uh, these mice, if they're untreated, the, uh, uh, there's no, the virus is not cleared from the, from the nervous system. So you continue to have replication of infectious uh, virus. So requires the adaptive immune response uh, for clearance. So we did uh, basically a simple, conceptually simple, simple at least uh, uh, experiment, which was to passively transfer uh, antibody or T cells, uh, lymph node cells, from um, uh, mice that had recovered from uh, infection to these skid mice to see how wh what we could give back that actually uh, uh, led to uh, virus clearance. Uh, <clears throat> and so the answer in this experiment was antibody. So you know, we started out with serum, we you know, moved on to monoclonal antibodies, et cetera. But, mm -hmm. but the observation was that there was very rapid clearance of infectious virus, plaque forming units of, of virus. And uh, offset by uh, a couple of days um, was the clearance of viral RNA. So viral RNA was also uh, cleared. It wasn't just neutralization of the, of the of virus in the, in the homogenates, uh, basically. Uh, but also observed at that time was the fact that it wasn't completely cleared, uh, that it was decreased uh, a lot, um, but we could continue to uh, see viral RNA uh, in the nervous system of these passively uh, immunized uh, mice. Uh, and T cells in this uh, situation actually made no difference. Uh, we subsequently found roles for T cells, but, uh, but nevertheless, the main answer was that antibody could definitely uh, do it. And Interestingly, they, as I say, we did a lot of work with uh, monoclonal antibodies, but the effective antibody, the specificity of that antibody was actually to a surface glycoprotein. So uh, the E2 glycoprotein and uh, subsequently a lot of work, and I'll show you only a little, uh, has gone into try to, trying to understand how in the world uh, this uh, actually works at a mechanistic uh, level. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, antibody to E2 glycoprotein was important. So we subsequently studied immunocompetent mice. So those were mice that were skid mice and uh, passive transfer, et, et cetera. That's just not the normal situation uh, to, uh, to understand better this clearance process. And so again, in immunocompetent mice, uh, as I showed you earlier, the uh, infectious virus is cleared very uh, uh, quickly, with a little over a week after uh, infection. But the, then this viral RNA, 
persists, uh, but it decreases over time, but then never is really clear. So you have continued residual uh, uh, RNA for, uh, for basically the life of the mouse. We've gone out to a year and mice don't live that long. So there's a, a, a basically a non-cytolytic process because these mice are well. Uh, the neurons look fine if you look at them on uh, by histopathology. Uh, a mechanism for clearing infectious virus uh, that allows uh, uh, residual RNA uh, to be uh, retained uh, in the nervous system. So. Uh, uh, we were interested in this process and we um, ran, thought it was a unique observation. And uh, so we wrote a review, uh, which was published in 1994, and on persistence of alpha viruses in vertebrate hosts. Well, so in that review and doing a literature search, um, it what became apparent that actually this had type of thing had been uh, observed for uh, several viral infections of the central nervous system, including other arthropod-borne uh, uh, viruses. And this is a quote from 1945, which one of the earliest that perceived this, um, uh, which basically says, it would appear that in some virus infections that recover from acute illness merely indicates the ability of the host to prevent further spread of the virus, but that the noxious agent is not destroyed and is capable of, again, spreading as soon as the host resistance is reduced. This was as part of a case report of Western equine encephalitis that was progressive over 40 years. At least in equine encephalitis, one questions whether the virus is ever destroyed once it invades the human organism. So the question had certainly been raised before, and we um, uh, had a simple uh, one, one, fig one simple figure in our review uh, that showed neurons. And IAP indicates an um, inhibitor of apoptosis uh, because one of the uh, one of the things that needs to happen for this whole process is that the cell has to survive infection, and mature neurons do. Immature neurons don't necessarily survive, but mature neurons do. Um, and then they get infected, they produce a virus, and then you have antibody that's produced, and then that uh, suppresses the uh, production of infectious virus, uh, and uh, but leaves uh, RNA uh, in in the cell. So that was the the concept uh, at uh, at that time. So subsequent studies, uh, we did a lot of work to understand more about what was going on in the brain, for one thing, and this just is look at at is looking at the inflammatory response. So the uh, entry of, uh, of lymphocytes, uh, in this case, uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells and B cells into the brain. And this first uh, period is the period during which there's clearance of infectious virus. So you have uh, entry first of CD8s, then CD4s, and then CD4s. And these are virus-specific uh, uh, cells. And, and clearance of infectious virus has, uh, has happened uh, then during this process of uh, the initial uh, induction of the inflammatory response in the brain. Uh, and then these cells actually stay, and they stay for a long period of time. They gradually decline in, in number, but they are then maintained, particularly B cells, at uh, a level that is above uh, a baseline uh, number of cells. And these uh, data are collected out through six months after infection. So there's persistence of the um, uh, virus-specific um, adaptive immune response, cells responsible for the uh, adaptive immune response in the CNS for, um, again, long periods of time uh, during which there we know there's uh, persistent RNA. Furthermore, those B cells, uh, uh, and again, antibody has been an area of our particular interest. Um, <clears throat> if you look at, the, this is virus-specific uh, antibody being produced in the brain of those same animals. And you can see there's a little bit that you can find during the time that the virus is being cleared, this uh, first 10-day period, uh, but uh, first IgM, but then IgG. But then there's uh, 
an increasing amount and there's an increasing enrichment of uh, cells that are producing antibodies specific for synthesis virus over uh, months after, um, uh, after apparent recovery uh, in this uh, acute period. And furthermore, <laughs> there's IgA produced as well, which is uh, some interest because you don't find much IgA to CNS infections peripherally. But nevertheless, there's a, a, a ongoing uh, production of antibody within the nervous system uh, uh, at the same time that you have ongoing persistence of uh, RNA. So then that uh, sophisticated our model a little bit uh, in that we get neurons infected. Uh, uh, then uh, there's uh, uh, the immune response is induced that uh, includes both local production of interferon, but also you know local production of antibody, local production of interferon gamma, which I really haven't talked about the T cell role, but uh, uh, it has a role. Uh, and then suppression of, of production of these in, of infectious virus with residual RNA. And then uh, the next step then is that you need this long-term control. Uh, we envisioned that this was long-term control, at least the ongoing production of antibody, the ongoing production of interferon gamma, and the persistence of our, uh, that you needed this adaptive, uh, ongoing adaptive immune response to control reactivation of uh, this persistent uh, virus that was present in the, in the neurons. So the, um, we assumed uh, during all these uh, studies <clears throat> that this RNA persistence was special for neurons because their long-lived cells, uh, you, <laughs> they're important and they're not replaceable. So that it, it wasn't, uh, it, I mean, it made some sense at least that the immune system would have a way to control virus infection. The host would have a way to control virus infection in these very important cells um, that was a non-cytolytic that didn't uh, result in the death of the, of, of the neurons. So we were surprised when we started to study measles. And just a little bit of background on the pathogenesis of measles, um, uh, which is a systemic rash, rash disease, primarily of, uh, of uh, children. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, virus, if virus is initiated in the respiratory tract. Uh, it spreads systemically uh, for a period of about 10 to 14 days before the onset of the rash. So it has a very long uh, latent period. And that's clinically silent, which which is uh, also an interesting feature uh, is what's going on with the innate or immune response during this period of time. So that's a, another uh, research, um, a research question. But <clears throat> basically the target cells that, uh, during, that the virus is infecting during all this period of time uh, are uh, multiple uh, types of cells, but they're epithelial cells, endothelial cells, lymphocytes, monocytes, all of these cells are replaceable. Uh, there's no reason that the immune system couldn't kill the virus infected cells and have new ones uh, be, uh, be produced. Uh, and so mainly for that reason, it never occurred to us that uh, RNA or virus wasn't completely cleared. The, uh, just note that the onset of the clinical symptoms, which are, uh, as I say, are 10 to 14 days later, uh, are actually uh, manifestations of the um, adaptive immune response, the, uh, the appearance of uh, both uh, antibody and, uh, and virus-specific T cells uh, uh, in response to uh, infection. And so then the question is, um, is it really cleared? So it, uh, there's no doubt that you can't recover infectious virus after the rash has cleared. Uh, but, uh, but the question then of, uh, of what is happening to the uh, infected cells and, and what the mechanism is for uh, clearance. So um, in the late uh, 90s, we were doing uh, measles uh, studies in Zambia. And it was a time that HIV infection was prevalent. Um, many children were infected. Um, the, there was not yet uh, uh, available treatment for the most part. Um, and so um, uh, our 
children that were uh, being hospitalized with measles, some of them were HIV infected and some weren't. Uh, and so we were really asking the question of whether uh, the outcome from infection was different for HIV infected kids versus uh, uh, uninfected kids. And as a part of that, we uh, brought back the, the children after they were discharged, uh, uh, so they'd survived infection, um, uh, to, uh, to do some follow-up studies. And we couldn't culture measles from any site after the rash was cleared. And that's a common observation for other people who've studied uh, acute measles. However, when we looked for RT-PCR for uh, measles virus RNA, uh, we found actually that uh, uh, many, uh, and we looked, the samples that we used were nasopharyn, geowashing, urine, and peripheral blood mononuclear cells. And we could recover it from at least one site, and we didn't get all these samples from every child, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but at least, at least 50% at a month were still positive at at least one site. And uh, when we thought, gosh, we'll, we'll bring them back again at three months and then we can show that they're all, uh, that they've cleared this uh, uh, virus. Uh, 35% were still positive at that time. And although we initially thought that it was more likely in HIV infected kids than non-infected kids, that turned out actually not really to be the case as we accrued more uh, individuals that, um, that children without HIV were almost as likely to have uh, be positive for RNA as children who had the co-infection with uh, HIV. So uh, we concluded that this was a uh, likely just slow clearance and that it was a normal part of uh, measles and recovery uh, from measles. So um, subsequent studies have all been done with rhesus macaques and uh, where we could really follow things more carefully and closely and uh, know when they got infected, uh, et cetera. And so this is six different uh, macaques and the red lines are infectious virus. And you can see that infectious virus, uh, the uh, peak viremia and the clearance of this is from peripheral blood mononuclear cells is really quite similar for these six different uh, animals. But the detection of RNA actually was not so uh, predictable. I mean, it was predictable that we were going to be able to uh, uh, to detect it um, after clearance of infectious virus, but not necessarily how much or at what time, uh, et cetera. So these are uh, different um, patterns for different monkeys. This, um, but this uh, sort of recurrence or late appearance is actually quite common uh, in one uh, manifestation or another, this uh, uh, sort of reappearance of being able to detect RNA uh, at later times. And these are this is two to three months after um, the acute uh, infection is common. So we put all that together uh, in, in a sort of, again, another review uh, about this uh, phenomenon. And the, uh, that you had the viremia, you had the onset of the rash, and at the onset of the rash, uh, you clear, uh, it, that initiates a clearance of infectious virus. And by the time the rash is faded, which takes three to five days, uh, you can no longer find uh, in, infectious virus for the most part, for most children and most animals. Uh, but if you're looking for uh, RNA in, in this case, again, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, you continue to find it for uh, at least uh, three to four months after uh, afterwards. But eventually um, uh, you, you can't, uh, uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells become negative, uh, at least by RT, uh, RT-PCR. However, if you biopsy lymph nodes and lymphoid tissue is a main site of uh, virus replication for measles, uh, then you find it, it's uh, abundant in lymphoid tissue. And that's out at least for six months after, um, after infection. So 
it is persistent, even though you're not necessarily finding it in, uh, in peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So then the question was uh, similar to the question that we asked for the uh, alpha virus encephalitis, what's going on with the immune response during all this uh, time where you have uh, 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 RNA present in peripheral blood and you also have RNA present in lymphoid tissue? Uh, well, the answer is a lot. Uh, first of all, you see, uh, and this is all virus specific uh, responses. Uh, you, you find these uh, interferon gamma producing T cells uh, early at the time, they, are, they appear at the time of the rash, that, and that's not surprising. And they, uh, and they decline uh, with clearance of an infectious virus, again, a pattern that is uh, common to many virus infections. Mm -hmm. Antibody is appearing also during the rash, and then, but it continues to improve both, both in amount and in, uh, in affinity for the measles virus um, uh, over time, over uh, uh, months again. Uh, you have other kinds of T cells appearing late. Um, there's a few uh, IL-17 producing cells uh, early, but later you have uh, actually large peaks in uh, IL-17 producing uh, T cells. And these peripheral uh, uh, T follicular helper cells, which are so important for antibody production, uh, are continuously increasing over, uh, over time, uh, their presence in, in blood. So uh, there's a very active uh, measles-specific immune response ongoing during this uh, uh, whole period. And um, I also remind you that uh, measles is an immunosuppressive virus and, um, and most measles deaths are due to other infectious diseases. And we know that this is a period of immune suppression as well with, uh, uh, again, complicated mechanisms uh, for, for that uh, immune suppression. But, uh, but the effect on the, there's a, a major effect on the immune system uh, in, during the recovery phase of, um, of measles. So uh, back to the basics of how do we get rid of viruses after they've infected us. Um, uh, first of all, you just two cells and one doesn't get infected, that's fine, that's no problem. But the cells that get infected uh, kind of have two options for outcomes. Uh, you, the virus could kill the cell, and in which case uh, you've eliminated it. Uh, but if the cell survives, uh, then, you, then the immune uh, system has uh, responsibility, basically, for um, eliminating uh, this, uh, this virus in, in infected cells. And the immune response um, can be ineffective and have a persistent infection. This could be like HIV or like HCV, and you have continuous production of infectious virus. But that's not what we're talking about for most of the, these, uh, these infections. Uh, so the immune system could be very effective and eliminate, kill the uh, infected cell. Or it could inhibit replication to the point that the cell is allowed to survive, but you have this persistent uh, RNA. So how would all of that uh, happen? So, well, first of all, to eliminate infected cells uh, requires either virus-induced uh, death or immune-mediated elimination. And there are a number of cytotoxic approaches that the immune system has for eliminating infected cells. Uh, so NK cells, uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes are um, assumed, and probably rightly so, uh, to be the most important for this uh, uh, process, but there are also cytokines uh, that lyse cells and antibody complement can also lyse cells. So there are other mechanisms that are, uh, are possible. But often the virus, the uh, cells are often not killed, even though in tissue culture, we are used to having cytopathic effect and death of cells uh, due to virus infections. That is actually not usually the case for in vivo and for primary cells. Uh, they have a lot of mechanisms for surviving a uh, virus infection. So um, <clears throat> then uh, if, if clearance is a non-cytolytic process, uh, you've got a situation set up for genomes uh, to persist. 
So how often is this the case? And what do we know about human virus infections for which we can continue to find uh, RNA persistent in human tissues after the acute infection is resolved? Uh, and so uh, not surprisingly, there's a bunch of them in the nervous system, and we've already mentioned Western equine encephalitis, it's a 1945 case of reports, uh, uh, but also um, Ebola, uh, measles we'll talk about in a minute, um, tick-borne encephalitis, uh, another uh, acute uh, 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 disease for which uh, there were uh, early reports that uh, monkeys particularly that were infected with tick-borne encephalitis had persistent uh, uh, progressive uh, inflammatory processes. Uh, the eye is another uh, uh, important thing and both with Ebola and Marburg uh, people uh, have had recurrent uh, uh, issues with uh, uveitis, et cetera. Um, respiratory infections, uh, a number of, um, uh, so we're currently dealing with SARS-CoV-2, but uh, evidence that rhinoviruses and respiratory syncytial virus RNA persists is also um, uh, uh, abundant. And uh, the reactivation of um, respiratory infections that occur in situations like in Antarctica, for instance, uh, also speaks to the uh, ability of these viruses to persist and then reactivate periodically and be uh, transmitted. Uh, very good data on enterovirus uh, cardiomyopathy uh, and the persistence of RNA and cardiac myocytes, uh, measles in the lymphoid tissue, uh, and the other uh, uh, popular place is, uh, are the testis. Um, uh, so Zika, Ebola, and Marburg have all been documented as persistent uh, long after uh, acute infection in the testis. And then there's a, a number of arthritic um, alpha viruses that uh, where uh, joint inflammation uh, uh, and uh, that's associated with persistent RNA uh, is ongoing for months to years after the initial uh, acute infection. So the CNS, the eyes, uh, the testis are often recognized before as, quote, immune privilege sites, but they're not the only places that the, uh, that the virus uh, RNA uh, can persist. So in other cells, in addition to, in other um, uh, tissues, in addition to uh, those. And the types of, uh, there hasn't been as much work. I mean, uh, for the most part, people just grind up tissue and do RT-PCR and see if there's RNA. So uh, detailed investigation of what types of cells have, have the RNA and uh, how they may be different from those that aren't persistently infected. Uh, those types of studies really are uh, have not been done. But the types of persistently infected cells that have been documented are certainly neurons, uh, cardiac myocytes. Monocyte macrophages actually turn out to be a, uh, a common place that uh, this RNA is found. But lymphocytes, Sertoli cells in the testis, epithelial cells, all of those have been documented in one uh, situation or uh, another. So this is a, a, just a nice diagram from a, a paper that uh, actually looked at uh, uh, Marburg virus or filovirus and, and uh, persistence in Sertoli cells. Uh, again, uh, this is a virus where uh, uh, there's been late transmission, uh, where sexual transmission has occurred uh, many months after the uh, apparent recovery from uh, acute uh, disease. And so uh, in the, the diagram uh, here, the little red spots are the, the virus and uh, that then can, uh, uh, infect uh, that cross the blood testis barrier to infect Sertoli cells. And then uh, the Sertoli cells uh, that can infect uh, other cells, the sperm cells, et cetera. And, uh, and then you can have uh, transmission of infectious virus. Uh, but this diagram also uh, points out the fact that if you look at the inf inflammation that occurs in this uh, tissue, uh, it's actually uh, an anti-inflammatory type of uh, uh, regulated uh, T cells. And that's common, particularly for these immune privilege sites. They have uh, uh, an abundance of uh, T regulatory cells. Uh, there's cytokines, uh, TGF beta, IL-10 that are locally produced. There's a lot invested in these tissues in uh, suppressing inflammatory uh, uh, responses uh, for, uh, for 
good reason. And so if you actually follow people um, with a, another Ebola, uh, we assume Ebola is doing the same kind of thing as Marburg. Uh, and there's also late transmission, many cases of late transmission after uh, Ebola. And so they, these people followed uh, uh, people who had recovered, men who had recovered from uh, Ebola virus infection over time for um, a persistence of RNA and semen. And this is the decay curve. And as you can see, it goes out for a couple of years uh, of you know, gradually decreasing uh, numbers of people who have, uh, who remain positive for uh, uh, Ebola virus RNA. But nevertheless, it's a prolonged process uh, and, uh, and very common uh, to have uh, persistence here. So how about SARS-CoV-2? I haven't talked about that, but that's one of our main interests these days, or uh, main interest of a lot of people for long COVID. And, and here we don't know as much. Uh, a lot of, it's not that a lot of people haven't looked for uh, RNA, but and they do find it uh, in uh, uh, prolonged, although not prolonged for months usually uh, in respiratory secretions, actually for much longer in stool when uh, people have looked at much, many more studies with respiratory secretions, obviously. Uh, and the, uh, there's at least one paper that shows there's persistence of a, a viral RNA and protein and a subset of uh, blood monocytes that uh, is uh, also uh, uh, common and a widespread detection of RNA and autopsy tissue. Now these studies uh, suffer from the fact that for the most part, they've studied people who are hospitalized, so uh, very ill uh, with the infection. So we don't necessarily have good ideas about what goes on with uh, people who have milder uh, infections. And many of those we know are, are do develop the symptoms of long COVID. So I, I think that uh, there's, there's work to be done to better understand uh, what's going on with the uh, uh, persistence of uh, uh, RNA and the sites of uh, persistence of RNA. We sort of look at the easy places, obviously, in humans, but uh, uh, you know, maybe we need to look harder elsewhere. So one of the criticisms to our studies and everybody else's in this uh, sphere is, oh, well, this is just chewed up RNA. And you don't really, uh, you know, what, what does it matter if there's fragments of RNA that are left uh, in the tissue? So, uh, and we all know that RNA is very susceptible to degradation. Anybody that works within the lab knows that. Um, so how can, how in the world can it persist inside the cytoplasm of a cell that's full of uh, RNAs? Uh, so we don't know the answer <laughs> to this question completely. And again, this is an area that people really have not looked at very carefully. Not only they did not identify the cells, they have not identified what's going on in those individual cells. Uh, but it's likely that since so many different kinds of cells can be involved, that this is going to be different uh, for different cells and different cells and different viruses. Uh, it, uh, hypotheses are that it could be protected by association with membranes or nucleocapsid proteins uh, in the cytoplasm of these previously uh, infected cells. Uh, local inflammation indicates that there is a translation of viral proteins. So something has to continue to keep the immune system interested to have this uh, long-term inflammation and production of antibody, et cetera, in, uh, in locally in tissue. So uh, at least there's some messenger, viral messenger RNAs that are capable of being translated. And late transmission, uh, uh, it, for those viruses that persist in testis, indicates the presence of full-length genomes that can uh, be uh, reactivated in those uh, situations. So how do virus-infected cells evade this immune-mediated uh, clearance? Uh, first of all, they can regulate the innate responses. Innate responses in general only control uh, virus replication. They don't eliminate uh, viruses, but, uh, but viruses definitely regulate their codon usage. Uh, can, uh, proteases can cleave cellular proteins, can make defective genomes. All of these things make them uh, uh, more likely uh, or less likely to um, uh, uh, 
it stimulate uh, uh, cytokine responses like uh, interferon, et cetera. Then there's the non-cytolytic clearance mechanisms. Uh, there's local suppression of cytotoxicity. We've mentioned that for, uh, for the testis. And then uh, uh, when you look at the, at the virus that has, the RNA of the virus that has persisted, you often find mutations. And uh, those mutations uh, are actually selected for decreased virion assembly, so no more infectious virus, decreased RNA synthesis, decreased expression of proteins at the cell surface, so no more ability of the immune system to even know the cell is infected. And these uh, mutations often promote cell survival. So, uh, and put together, they make themselves able to um, uh, preserve the cell and then sort of dampen, uh, uh, be under the radar screen uh, kind of of these virus infections. So just to mention the um, uh, non-cytolytic clearance, since this is an area that we worked hard on and not, not necessarily determined the mechanism, but we made a little progress. These anti uh, E2 antibodies uh, for Syndos virus that uh, suppress virus replication in neurons uh, require cross-linking, uh, have to be bivalent. Uh, so they cross, and E2 is a protein that's expressed on the surface of uh, alpha virus infected cells. And that cross-linking actually induces uh, uh, NF-kappa B signaling, uh, which induces production of some NF-kappa B IL-6 family member proteins, particularly LIF. And, and we are focused here on neurons. And so this is a neuro, uh, rather neuro specific uh, cytokine. Um, and then that activates STAT3. So it's a complicated signaling pathway that results in STAT3, of course, um, improves cell survival in addition to regulating a, a number of uh, these are transcription factors that regulate uh, antiviral as well as pro-survival uh, genes. So uh, this non-cytoclinic clearance process is complicated, and uh, but does result both in suppression of the virus replication and the likelihood that the cell itself is going to survive uh, infection. So how about mutations? Uh, so um, my example here is going to be measles because that's been very well studied. So there's a very late complication of measles, uh, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, occurs to eight to 10 years after um, uh, the clinical manifestations appear eight to 10 years after the acute virus infection. But the virus that's present in the nervous system is basically a, 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 a variation of the virus that the child was originally infected with. And this is just immunohistochemistry showing the virus is abundant in the uh, brain uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, a child with uh, this, uh, this disease. So there's uh, plenty of viruses in the nervous system. The, uh, this is the diagram of the virus itself. The, uh, the uh, proteins that are make up the surface of the uh, of the virion and also are present on the surface of virus infected cells because these viruses bud from the plasma membrane uh, is the matrix protein, the fusion protein, and the hemagglutinin or neuroattachment uh, protein. And when you sequence then the virus that's in these SSPE brains, you find that these three, the genes for these three proteins are highly mutated. So for and the initiator, AUG is often deleted. There's a lot of AI hypermutation across the genome. For F is always uh, mutated. Uh, and that's with cytoplasmic um, uh, with, uh, domain truncations, deletions, mutations, all that uh, result in decreased budding and enhanced fusion. So the virus is now able to move from cell to cell without ever having to be produced. And you can't recover infectious virus from these SSPE brains, despite all the uh, uh, measles virus protein that you can see and all the evidence of infection. And then H is also uh, mutated. So mutations have been selected, basically, uh, uh, for being able to escape uh, immune recognition, immune elimination, and virus production. So you put all that together, um, and these are different mechanisms that both the virus has and the host has for fostering 
uh, persistence of uh, viral RNA after uh, apparent recovery. So you have a virus that infects a cell, but and then the, the virus can, uh, 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 so these are RNA viruses, so they're constantly mutating. They, you know, it's a whole, uh, you know, a panoply usually of uh, mutations uh, that could be selected uh, in different situations. So uh, selection occurs for uh, prevention of virus maturation, uh, suppression of RNA synthesis, uh, and uh, then uh, these mutations that I've talked about, and then post-translational modifications that occur, phosphorylation of particular proteins will uh, suppress replication, uh, uh, et cetera. And then the induction of innate responses, uh, production of uh, defective viral genomes. And innate responses could be both a plus and a minus for the virus. Um, it, it, can uh, control virus replication, but at the same time, controlled virus replication means if there's less virus being produced, that less virus can be persistent and be maintained and the cell can survive. So uh, these uh, inability of the RNA sensors to respond to that RNA. And then on the host side, there's non-cytolytic clearance. We've mentioned antibody interferon gamma is another mechanism. Um, uh, and then the immunosuppressive environment for certain uh, tissues and certain uh, organisms that will uh, suppress the ability of the CD8 T cells to be cytotoxic uh, or even to uh, uh, mature in those uh, tissues. So there's lots of examples of um, uh, persistence and its consequences. I showed you examples of places of persistence. Uh, the consequences are the uh, next uh, uh, area to try to understand. So for measles, uh, we mentioned so SSPE, uh, and, and now we're going to go into the uh, immune response in a little more depth. Ebola and Marburg, the phenoviruses, late sexual transmission, recurrent uveitis, encephalitis, post-viral syndrome. So uh, this post-viral syndrome, which is very relevant for the long COVID that, uh, that we're thinking about, is very common after, I mean, it's up to 70 5% of people who've recovered from Ebola have uh, uh, ongoing uh, uh, problems. Uh, enterovirus, cardiomyopathy, and then uh, how about SARS-CoV-2, uh, long COVID. And I, we still have a lot of work to do, I think, I know, uh, to actually understand this, but I think understanding the role that persistent RNA may be playing is going to be important. So back to the immune system. So uh, the immune system is actually the most sensitive detector of antigen being produced. So I've mentioned that with respect to maintaining these inflammatory responses locally in areas of, uh, of uh, viral uh, RNA persistence. Um, but there's also a fair amount of data that this might be one of the ways that we could detect whether, um, it's one thing to do a lot of RT-PCR, but then say there's RNA present, but uh, it's another way to detect uh, whether there's continued uh, production, at least of viral proteins. Uh, I admit there are ways for proteins to be persistent in a, uh, that don't require their ongoing synthesis, but uh, uh, another way is that you have ongoing synthesis of viral uh, proteins. So just a couple examples of that before we uh, end. Um, and this is looking at what's going on in those lymphoid tissues of those monkeys that have uh, persistent RNA, measles RNA in lymphoid tissue. Uh, so if you look at the bottom, this is uh, biopsying lymph nodes and looking for germinal centers and looking for proliferation. Uh, this is a KI67 staining, so proliferating cells in germinal centers. So indication of ongoing stimulation of uh, germinal center responses. And so this is uh, 71 days after, more than two months after uh, uh, infection, you have still very active germinal centers. But if you look uh, five months after infection, you have even more. And in fact, if you quantitate the numbers of uh, germinal centers, and these are uh, color-coded monkeys uh, for, uh, so the red monkey uh, had 
10 germinal centers uh, at, uh, at two months, but then had 25 germinal centers in their uh, lymph node at, uh, at uh, five months. So, it, and then for, for all monkeys, there were increased numbers. There were more germinal centers present uh, late than early. So there's continuing uh, stimulation of the immune response of antibodies in these cells for long periods of time. And this is looking at uh, the TFH cells, again, in the periphery uh, that, that are uh, measles virus specific, uh, uh, either age specific or end specific, and increasing numbers of both of them over time, uh, uh, both specificities. So uh, lots of evidence of ongoing stimulation of uh, the antibody response. Furthermore, that's manifested in the peripheral blood by looking at antibody secreting cells. So these are measles specific antibody secreting cells. The bar is when the rash is. This is when the when we clear infectious virus uh, after the rash. And you can see there are, there are antibody secreting cells present mainly uh, uh, during, the, uh, during the rash, but actually they increase in number uh, over the next six weeks and then are maintained a continuous production of antibody secreting cells, measles specific antibody secreting cells, again, for five or six months after a uh, parent recovery. And intriguing to us um, is the fact if you look at total numbers of antibody secreting cells, uh, we maintain uh, <clears throat> pretty much the same number um, uh, and this, uh, maintain IgG levels at the same level um, over long periods of time, years. Uh, uh, but there is a, a transient increase in the numbers of total antibody secreting cells uh, that occur uh, at the time of the rash. So we're interested in the regulation of these long-lived plasma cells that may be being evicted from the bone marrow during this, uh, uh, during this time. But then total cells go back to normal. That's not true for uh, measles-specific uh, cells. And this is uh, <clears throat> data from another paper uh, for another group uh, that look, that's looking at uh, long COVID. And so what they did was compare the T cell, uh, oh, this is a rather Ebola virus, but this kind of thing I think needs to be done with long COVID. So this is Ebola and post Ebola syndrome. And if you look at the people that have the post Ebola syndrome versus those that don't, they're much more likely to have uh, CD8 T cell responses to a virus specific T cell responses detected in peripheral blood uh, than those who've recovered. And this is both CD4 and, uh, and CD8. So uh, this uh, uh, understanding of the ongoing late stimulation of, of, uh, of uh, adaptive immune responses, I think is important. So in conclusion, the persistence of viral RNA, I hope I convinced you, the persistence of viral RNA after acute infections is common. And actually, I think in every instance in which people have actually looked, they found it. Um, they, uh, people didn't look for a long time because nobody knew to, knew to look. Um, uh, it, both uh, viral and host mechanisms foster suppression of the production of infectious virus, uh, separate from the survival of infected cells and the persistence of RNA. Consequences are varied, um, the host and, and host and virus dependent, uh, and it's certainly going to be dependent on where uh, this persistence is. Uh, uh, but there certainly could be progressive cellular dysfunction, potential uh, uh, persistent cytokine chemokine production. This is what people have focused on mainly for um, long COVID, uh, but really there's not been data forthcoming that it's very convincing that this is what's causing the long-term uh, uh, symptoms that people have. Uh, so there's then long-term and recurrent stimulation of adaptive immune responses. These peaks and valleys um, also of, uh, of finding RNA, of finding T cells, of, uh, et cetera, uh, are actually common. So it's like there's waves of, um, of uh, stimulation. Late reactivation of the infectious virus uh, is, is also obviously a, 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 an issue. So just an uh, overview of the, uh, lots of people in my lab have participated in the studies. The people in, in bold are the ones that have 
uh, contributed data to what I've uh, actually talked about, but this has been an ongoing area of interest uh, for uh, my lab. So I am happy to answer any questions. Thank okay. you so much, Diane. That was really a great lecture and uh, really very comprehensive and a uh, number of uh, most interesting uh, uh, issues and, and challenges. Thank you so much. We have several questions uh, that you can get on the Q&A, actually. Can you see them? Okay, let me see. You have the famous Bob Gallo who have immediately asked several questions. Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, is it in the chat or I don't have the Q&A? No, in the Q&A. Oh, Q &A. Q &A. I see, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anonymous attendee. All right. We describe the molecular biology of synthesis persistence in the in the neuron. Well, I think I've described as much as we know. It's present in the in the cytoplasm, and we're just now doing a more sophisticated studies like single cell RNA seq and that kind of thing to look at in vivo. Uh, we've done a lot in in vitro, but. Um, but we still don't uh, really understand uh, uh, the, uh, the we, it regulates both the uh, antibody regulates both the uh, types of viral RNA being produced as well as uh, as the, the protein. So there's we have a lot more work to do, put it that way. Bob Gallo, thanks uh, for the, uh, let's see. Uh, is the RNA intact? Well, that's a, a, a very, a very good question, uh, and um, and we really don't know. Um, we know in uh, in vitro for the Simbus virus that we can find full length genomes. We don't have that same kind of information for measles, and and we don't really have an in vitro um, uh, way of looking. And so uh, our current uh, attempts are uh, doing RNA-seq on peripheral blood mononuclear cells and lymph node cells that are in infected. And, uh, and we'll probably have to do nanopore sequencing to try to, uh, don't know how well that works for negative strand viruses, but we'll find out. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, is it known whether in any acute RNA virus infection that RNA does not persist? As I say, I think, in all situations, the LCMV people used to tell me that it doesn't persist in LCMV, but I think that that has been modified uh, somewhat. Um, uh, so I think that in places, it, you know, you, you have to look hard, you have to look in the right places and you have to use sensitive techniques. So uh, a negative is not always uh, for sure, uh, but I think that where people have looked carefully, it's usually been found. Uh, will you def describe defective interfering particles as one explanation of the RNA virus persistence? Yes, uh, that's been described best for respiratory syncytial virus and other paramyxoviruses. And so it may be an issue with measles and we just haven't looked. Um, but that, that then you, you, get, uh, you get some stimulation of the innate response enough that the cell can survive and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, persist. Uh, so this ability to produce uh, defective interfering particles uh, uh, and then stimulate uh, a little bit the uh, uh, innate response uh, is, uh, you know, makes uh, it more likely that the cell can survive uh, infection, uh, basically. Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, what do you think uh, about this? See below, uh, uh, nature. Uh, I have to I have to read the paper, I think. Yeah. Oh, integration of viral genome. Yeah. So that's a, actually a hypothesis. Yes, Zandoff, yeah, way back, that's measles. Um, uh, and uh, that's been hypothesis. Um, uh, actually, even Rob Zinker now has a paper that uh, that says that happens with LCMB. Um, and, and, you know, it's possible. Uh, I mean, uh, cells do have their own reverse transcriptases that could be copying this um, uh, genome. And uh, we have not done the careful studies that would be required to say that it is or is not happening in the, in the viruses that 
that we've looked at. So uh, I've not favored that, but uh, that I, you know, I really think that it can persist without having a DNA copy, but uh, that doesn't mean that that isn't, uh, isn't happening. Uh, although Zanoff was, uh, was dismissed, but I think uh, too early. <laughs> um, if you, understood well, uh, hypothesized that uh, translation of viral proteins could induce inflammation, couldn't residual inflammation observed whether viral RNA persists be due to uh, pattern recognition receptor stimulation by viral nucleic acids as an alternative. So yes, and that has definitely been, uh, been proposed uh, that, uh, that basically what you're getting is the stimulation of an innate response through these uh, pattern recognition receptors uh, with production of cytokines and then, um, uh, and, and, and that could make contribute. I mean, I have to, to um, I mean, it's like, this is likely to be complicated and it's likely to have a, uh, uh, multiple uh, contributing uh, features that, that may differ from one virus to another. So uh, I certainly can't dismiss the possibility of uh, these innate responses contributing. And uh, the, those responses for the, I guess they could attract, uh, they're not going to necessarily attract the virus specific uh, um, T cells and B cells, uh, uh, because of the attractions will be a little more nonspecific from chemokines, et cetera, that are produced. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I, as I say, I think that definitely could be a contributor. What do you think are the mechanisms underlying SARS CoV 2 RNA persistence in severely immunocompromised people? Well, I think that if you, people who can't make a good adaptive immune response are, and that's been shown, uh, I mean, what I've been talking about has really all been in uh, immunocompetent uh, uh, animals and people. I think that uh, the ability of these viruses to continue to replicate and often continue to produce the, not just RNA persistence, but continue to produce infectious virus. If, uh, if there's no adaptive uh, immune response or if there's an uh, a, uh, inadequate uh, adaptive uh, immune response, is, uh, definitely, uh, it can defi that definitely happens. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And it's also a situation in where you can get continued mutation of uh, viruses. And so certainly been hypothesized that, uh, that this is a mechanism for reducing these, or uh, fostering the induction of these variants or the production of these variants in those people. Um, uh, there was now, a question on polio. <laughs> The, uh, it's implied in, uh, that the RNA uh, replication. Um, no, uh, but be, before you have a question from John Sinet, is there persistence oh. of polio virus? Oh, oh, sorry, missed your question. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, again, uh, RNA could be detected and actually uh, uh, for very long periods of time. After uh, after vaccination, even after uh, uh, receiving the uh, live virus uh, uh, vaccine that uh, uh, from stool, and just talking to somebody yesterday about noroviruses, uh, they continue to be shed from uh, stool for again for long periods of time. Mostly, people have uh, looked at RNA, uh, so the the recovery of uh, infectious virus. Uh, I don't know about. Polio. So uh, we certainly, certainly get ongoing transmission, uh, which we're demonstrating now, um, of these uh, of these viruses. But uh, but yes, uh, persistent shedding of polio is uh, virus. Both the vaccine and the wild type virus is common. How long it's ongoing? I don't think that's something that people have really looked at very carefully. Um, actually, uh, although that would be an answerable question, I think. Uh, you have Alan, Alan Schmaljohn. Yes. Uh, 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 it's implied and reasonable that the RNA replication machinery remains at least partially intact in the studies and concerns your site. Uh, otherwise, the RNA persistence alone would be problematic for the new RNA uh, vaccines. Uh, 
yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Although we could use them to stimulate a little more durable response, but uh, the uh, uh, I think that's right that you need to have uh, uh, con probably continued production. Although we, yeah, uh, of uh, of at least message, uh, right, and genome turnover. I agree. I just think the whole molecular uh, virology is uh, something that really has not been adequately addressed, and we need good uh, we need good systems uh, to that mimic it to to do it. And we want to understand the uh, the, uh, uh, the the in vivo implications of this. Uh, Oh, the vaccine attenuated measles virus uh, persisted. That's a, a great question. Um, and uh, no, nobody's looked. Uh, we're in the process of doing that uh, for uh, in our monkeys. Uh, the actual, um, uh, the vaccine virus replicates very poorly in lymphoid tissue compared to wild type virus. In fact, it's hard to find it. And, it's, and there's a frequently not a viremia. So, uh, so I don't know the answer to that question. And we don't actually don't have a good idea of where the vaccine virus replicates. As I say, it doesn't replicate very well in lymphoid tissue. And so, it, but it, it replicates great in epithelial cells, uh, et cetera. So it's possible that it's, uh, that it's stimulating the immune response in a different way than the wild type virus. But good question. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Diane, and thank you everybody for attending. That was really a great seminar. So thank you, Diane. Bye-bye. Okay, you're welcome, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Bye.